making the headlines tonight. Hindu Rodong Sihat Muni praises the leadership of National Assembly President Hei Somerin and Prime Minister Hun Sain. The draft law on the amendment of Article 140 to increase the Board of Governors of Municipal, District, Commune, Province and Capital was approved by the Council of Ministers. Eyewitness video showed people running through a building in central Marupol as explosions sound. Formula One will light up Las Vegas in 2023 as the streets of Sin City are taken over by the fastest cars and most famous drivers in the world. And a great horn bill has beaten cancer with the help of 3D technology and a medical team from Florida. This is the Daily Roundup on ESA News Channel. A very good evening to you. I am Tekanin. The King of Cambodia, His Majesty King Norodom Sihak Muni, has sent a letter to the National Assembly praising the leadership of National Assembly President Heng Samarin and Prime Minister Hun Sen and saying that he is satisfied with the continuous progress Cambodia has seen so far. ESA News reporter Ashana Gojin has more details. In the royal message delivered on the occasion of the opening of the seventh session of the sixth legislature of the National Assembly, His Majesty King Norodom Sihamoni stated that the National Assembly, headed by President Heng Samrin, continues to perform well on its duties and establishes legislature to build state policies and laws more properly in Cambodia, which is in line with the nation's development and regional integration in the world. He said in his message, all these achievements have provided Cambodians the ability to live in peace, security, and good order, and makes the kingdom worthy of a prosperous and high profile on the international stage. His Majesty also praised the leadership of Prime Minister Hun Sen, who he said has made the right political decisions to maintain peace, social stability, and development in Cambodia, and strongly protects the national economy, prevents inflation, harmonizes all nations, and promotes the well-being of the people. The National Assembly of the Kingdom of Cambodia held its seventh session of the sixth legislature under the chairmanship of the President of the National Assembly, Heng Sam Rin, on Friday morning, 1st of April. The session was attended by 93 members of the National Assembly. The seventh session of the sixth legislature had four agendas, including the reading of the letter sent by His Majesty King Norodom Sihamoni, reviewing the sixth legislature summary report on the activities of the National Assembly between the sixth and seventh sessions electing Mr. Oik Kim On as a new member of the Constitutional Council for a nine-year term, and discussing approving of the draft law on plant protection and phytosanitary. Darshana Gochen, EAC News. The draft law on the amendment of Article 140 to increase the Board of Governors of Municipal, District, Commune, Province and Capital was approved by the Council of Ministers on Tuesday morning under the chairmanship of Prime Minister Hun Sen. ESC News reporter Anthony Ellis has the details. This amendment of Article 140 of the Law on the Administration of Capital, Province, Municipality, District and Commune will increase the number of mayors in district and communes from five to seven people the number of provisional governors from 7 to 11 people and the number of capital governors increased to 11 people. Government spokesman Fay Sipan said that increase is being made in line with the ongoing sub-national administration reforms focusing on decentralisation and deconcentration. The government is making a certificate shift to providing public services and local development to lower level administrations as part of these forms. Spokesman Pay Sipan said to improve social, economic, development and the quality of life of local people, it is essential to strengthen sub-national institution and human resources to ensure that each sub-national administration has more capacity and potential to contribute to achieving the Royal Government's goal of transforming Cambodia into an upper-middle income country by 2030. He added that after this law passes the National Assembly and is officially announced by the King, the number of governors voted into office each capital province, municipality, district and commune will be studied and reviewed. In his closing remarks at the conclusion of the dismantation and the implementation of the national program of the sub-national democratic development phase two workshop on the 21st of March of 2022, Prime Minister Hun Sen stated that the development of human resources at the level of the sub-national administration is an important task of Cambodia must undertake in order to further develop and succeed in migrating various tasks. He said, while the sub-nation levels should be responsible 
we see that it is lacking in strength, so we need to amend the law limiting the number of responsible people in the framework of provincial and district governors. At present, there are a total of 175 governors in 25 capitals and provinces of Cambodia. Each provincial capital has seven governors. Additionally, there are 1,020 district governors in a 204 municipalities of Cambodia, which five governors in each district. Anthony Ellis, EAC News. The Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation and Special Envoy of the ASEAN Chair on Myanmar, Deputy Prime Minister Prasok Khan, met with the Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General on Myanmar, Dr. Nolin Haizar, to exchange views and discuss matters related to the close cooperation between ASEAN and the UN at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on Thursday. During the meeting, Dr. Hazer affirmed that the United Nations guaranteed its full support and participation on the provision of aid assistance and the establishment of a humanitarian corridor for Myanmar. ESC News reporter Sui Po Kong has more. According to a press release issued on Thursday, 31st March 2022, by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Deputy Prime Minister Prasad Khan began the discussion by briefing his interlocutor on the activities, challenges, and outcome of his meeting with relevant stakeholders during his first visit to Myanmar on 21 to 23 March 2022. He particularly stressed the three urgent priorities of making steps toward ending the violence, facilitating distribution of humanitarian assistance, and building trust and enable environment to start an inclusive and constructive dialogue among all concerned parties. In response, Dr. Hazer acknowledged the difficulty Cambodia faces as the current ASEAN chair and further commended the effort of Prime Minister Hun Sen and Deputy Prime Minister Prasad Khan in paving the way for a solution to be found on the ongoing Myanmar crisis. Deputy Prime Minister Prasakon and Dr. Nolan Hazer also discussed the organization of the consultative meeting on humanitarian assistance and the establishment of a humanitarian corridor to ensure smooth and safe process of assistance delivery to Myanmar. In this regard, the UN Special Envoy assured the Deputy Prime Minister of the UN's full support engagement. Additionally, the two Special Envoys also discussed the possible role played by some countries in the region and the international community as a whole in finding a settlement to the crisis in Myanmar. This marked the second meeting between Deputy Prime Minister Prasad Khan and Dr. Nolin Hazer since 13 December 2021. Srei EAC News. Deputy Commander-in-Chief of the Royal Cambodian Armed Forces and Commander-in-Chief of the Royal Cambodian Army, Lieutenant General Human Knight, signed a memorandum of understanding with the Commander of the Chinese People's Liberation Army Ground Force, General Li Chen Li, on Thursday, 31st of March. EAC News reporter Deshana Gojin has more. The signed MOU between Cambodia and China aims to strengthen the long-term cooperation and close relationship between the two armies on the basis of equality and mutual benefit. In a statement issued on Thursday, 31st March, the Royal Cambodian Army stated, This document is an important step in paving the way for further cooperation in key areas. This event can be considered a turning point in the history of relations between the two armies. During the signing ceremony, Lt. Gen. Hun Manait and Lt. Gen. Liu Zhen Li expressed their pride in the friendly relations, mutual trust, mutual respect, as well as the continued close cooperation in all fields between the two countries and peoples of Cambodia and China, which brings mutual benefits, development, and common prosperity based on the comprehensive strategic partnership, the steel friendship, and community building toward a common destiny between the two countries. The two sides also stress the importance of bilateral cooperation between the two armies, which will play an important role in supporting the progress of the comprehensive strategic partnership as well as community building. Darshana Gochen, EAC News. The Minister of Tourism, Taung Khan, has stated his expectation that there will be more tourists visiting different parts of Cambodia during the Khmer New Year, even despite the rising price of gasoline. He said that he believes many will travel during his upcoming holiday because hotel rooms and guest houses in major provinces such as Siem Reap and Sihanouk Wheel have a lot of bookings. ESC News reporter Anthony Ellis has more. At a press conference on the 30th of March Wednesday, Minister Tong Kong said on occasion of the upcoming Khmer New Year, there will be a tourist going to visits. Although the price of gasoline has increased, people will save by changing their consumption behaviour and by travelling in groups and reduce travel costs. In fact, as of today, 
There are many hotel reservations in Seen Rip, Mondamakuri, and Seahinkville, and other coastal areas. The Minister hopes that the people will be happy and ready to visit different parts of Cambodia during the upcoming Khmer New Year. He also advised relevant stakeholders to prepare to receive both national and international tourists by organising entertainment venues to be safe and clean, preparing to provide a good quality of service and most importantly, make an effort to prevent extra fees for services and food. The Director of Tourism Statistics Management Department of Ministry of Tourism, Kong Sopharek, said that the first quarter of 2022, Cambodia received a total of 151,680 international tourists, marking an increase of 114% compared to the first quarter of 2021. From this total, 86,588 arrived by air, 63,048 by land, and 2,044 by water. The director added a total of 1,181 flights arrived in Cambodia during this time, of which 1,012 landed in Phnom Penh, 144 in Sin Rip, and 55 in Sydneyville. Anthony Ellis, EAC News. Cambodia has reported 57 new COVID-19 cases, none of which were imported. There have been 102 patient recoveries and no new deaths. The kingdom has now recorded 15,241 cases of Omicron, 1,351 imported, and 13,000 entered 90 community cases. Cambodia's COVID-19 case tally has now climbed to 135,682. The death toll stands at 3,054. The number of patients treated successfully since the pandemic reached Cambodia is 131,808, and the tally for imported cases is at 21,208. Healthcare workers are currently treating a total of 744 people. Now for a look at news making international headlines this Friday, 1st of April. We retire from his acting career after being diagnosed with asphasia, a disease that is impacting his cognitive abilities, his family said in the statement on Wednesday, March 30th. 67-year-old Willis achieved initial fame for his role in the 1980s comedy drama TV series Moonlighting before becoming most well-known as the tough guy, action hero who shouted Yippee Gaye in five die-hard films. The actor has appeared in around 100 films across his four-decade career, winning acclaim for roles in Pulp Fiction and The Sixth Sense. Willis has won one Golden Globe Award and two Emmy his family said in their statement that this is a really challenging time for them and they will move forward as a strong family unit. They also thanked fans for the love, compassion and support Willis continues to receive. Asphasia is a condition that affects one's ability to comprehend or formulate language due to damage in specific regions of the brain. This includes the ability to speak, write and effectively communicate with others. Asphasia can occur following strokes or head injuries but can also arise over time due to brain tumors or degenerative diseases. Willis had been especially active in recent years, appearing in eight movies released in 2021 alone. The satirical Grazia Film Award gave Willis his own special category this year, nominating him eight times for Worst Performance by Bruce Willis in a 2021 movie. The Grazia Awards tweeted an apology on Wednesday after hearing about his diagnosis. In 2006, Willis received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, a Los Angeles landmark honoring legends of film, television and music. Police in Sri Lanka's capital, Colombo, clashed with hundreds of protesters on Thursday the 31st of March, as public anger escalated against the government's handling of the worsening economic crisis. Some protesters set fire to a bus in the first escalations of violence in Colombo since the economic crisis took hold in recent months. Another bout of violence broke out during a protest near the private residence of Sri Lankan's president, Kachabaya Raptakissa, which injured two journalists and four police officers. Sri Lanka is turning off streetlights to save electricity, a minister said on Thursday, as its worst economic crisis in decades brought more power cuts and halted trading in its main stock market. The island of 22 million people has been struggling with rolling blackouts for up to 13 hours a day because of the government states it does not have enough foreign exchange for fuel imports. The power cuts added to the pain of Sri Lankans already dealing with shortages of essentials and rocketing prices. Retail inflation hit 18.7% 
and food inflation reached 30.2%. A diesel shipment under $500 million credit line from India is expected to arrive on Saturday the 2nd of April. Water levels at reservoirs feeding hydroelectric projects have fallen to record lows, while the demand of hit record highs during the hot, dry season. The Colombo Stock Exchange cut daily tradings for two hours from the usual four and a half hours because of power cuts during the rest of the week. But shares slid after the market opened on Thursday and the CSC halted trading for 30 minutes. The third time in two days after index tracking, leading companies dropped by more than 5%. The crisis is a result of badly timed tax cuts and impact of the coronavirus pandemic coupled with historically weak government finances, leading to foreign exchange reserves dropping by 70% in the last two years. Sri Lanka was left with reserves of 2.31 billion as from February, forcing the government to seek help from International Monetary Fund and other countries, including India and China. Tyrone Longest running traditional puppet television show is creating non-fungible tokens or NFTs to help bring their art form to a new modern audience and generate a fresh income stream. NFTs are crypto assets representing a digital item such as an iMac, video or even land in virtual world that exists on the blockchain and carry unique digital signature that cannot be reproduced. The prices of some have risen so fast over the last year that speculators around the world sometimes flip them with a day for a profit. Pili International Multimedia, which to make film with Puppet as its studio in central Taiwan Junlin County says it want to be a pioneer in using NFTs as another source of revenue. Seka Horn, the studio brand manager, said that the online world is developing so fast that they need to catch up by jumping straight in to fully understand. Pili has thousands of glove puppet characters, a traditional part of Taiwanese street entertainment culture spinning colorful and highly stylish stories of heroic courage and romance, often with mature art. The puppets are painstakingly created and expertly maneuvered during the filming of the show, with custom that are sewn on strain of hair meticulously put in place. Pili said four of the puppet characters were made into digital version and more than 30,000 of these have been sold as NFTs since their listing in early February. The company declined to reveal the profit sharing with the market platform but said each NFT cost $40, translating to generated revenue of at least $1.2 million, who said the initial listing had so lost seconds after to launching on Vivi is now working on transforming up to 50 other puppet characters into NFTs in the next two years, potentially another million dollar revenue stream for the studio. Eyewitness video from Tuesday 29th of March showed people running through a building in central Maropol as explosions sound. Shelling began in the port city four weeks ago when Russia laid its siege. In the video obtained by Reuters, explosions can be heard as people run through an amusement center. Later, the video shows rubble and damage on buildings and cars. Nearly 5,000 people, including about 210 children, have been killed in Mariupol since the Russian siege, a spokesperson for Mayor Vadim Bochenko said on Monday, March 28th. His office said 90% of Mariupol's buildings had been damaged and 40% destroyed, including hospitals, schools, kindergartens, and factories. Zelensky said Ukrainian forces had pushed back the Russians from Kiev and Chernihiv, two cities Moscow had announced would no longer be the focus of attacks as they seek to secure the separatist Donbas and Luhansk regions in the southeast. There will be battles ahead. We still need to go down a very difficult path to get everything we want, he said. The situation in the south and in the Donbass remains extremely difficult. The Chinese State Consular and Foreign Minister Wang Yi on Thursday called for efforts to make the China-U.S.-Russia consultation mechanism play a more effective role in the peaceful reconstruction of Afghanistan. Wang made the remarks when meeting with special envoys and representative of Afghan issue of China. The United States, Russia and Pakistan in Tangzi, East China's Anu province. Wang noted that China, the US, Russia and Pakistan are major stakeholders in the Afghan issue, and the four countries have important influence in Af Afghanistan. Since major changes took place in Afghanistan, the constitution mechanism has played a constructive role in facilitating a smooth transition in the country, said Wang. Under new circumstances, the four parties need to adjust their work, 
support Afghanistan in the reconstruction and improving the people's livelihoods and promote Afghanistan's responding to the expectation of internally community, especially in the fulfilment of its commitments of the completely break with, fight and sweep under the terrorist force, he said. For the next step of the mechanism's work, Wang made three suggestions. First, to enhance coordination, expand consensus, and together send out positive signals. Second is the focus on dealing with concrete issues, especially unfreezing Afghanistan's overseas assets and cancelling unreasonable sanctions on which the US should take concrete actions. Third is to make the constitution mechanism play an effective role in the peaceful reconstruction of Afghanistan and to the well-being of the people. On the same day, the meeting of the China-US-Russia-Pakistan constitution mechanism under the Afghan issues was held in Tangzhou. The Chinese side chaired the meeting. An exhibition at the Queen's Scottish residence of Balmoral Castle showcased the monarch's dresses and miniature toy cars played in by young royals as part of the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. The exhibition also featured a sculpture installation by artist Joseph Rosano named Salmon School, comprising of 250 suspended mirror glass shapes that appear as a school of salmon. The artwork, which aimed to raise awareness of the threat facing wild salmon from climate change, was shown in November UN Climate Change Conference COP26, even in Glasgow. The From River to the Royal exhibition will run from April 1st to August 2, 2022. This outfit here, which was for the Diamond Jubilee, um, the Queen wore this when she toured around Ballater. It's been designed, and the hat is designed, all by Angela Kelly. I love the Queen's Day outfit here, which she wears when she's on holiday at Balmoral. Now, the tartan of the kilt is the Balmoral tartan, and that was designed by Prince Albert, and it reflects the colour of granite. Only the royals and the Queen's piper can wear the Balmoral tartan. And then this outfit here, the yellow dress, um, which again, you'll have seen the Queen wear to Ascot, but also we have it on our biscuit tin. So we're very happy to have the yellow outfit here this year for our visitors to see. If we go further around the room, we've also got some of the uh, sports cars that the young royals have, have obviously had fun in. We have a, a replica of an Aston Martin and an American racing car. And then we keep going round and then we have other exhibits about court at Balmoral when the royals are here for their summer holiday. Uh, you know, I conceptualize the idea and I've made a lot of the fish, but it represents a collaboration of many, many people uh, to bring attention to what's happening with salmon and how if we work together, we can potentially stem the, the tide of their, you know, of their extinction, if I might use the word. And the reason glass was chosen is because it's fragile, transparent, and reflective, like the resource that we're trying to create a dialogue about. Hello. These are eggs, too. After the break, a look at all the latest sports news. If it's happening and you need to know about it, you'll get it all right here. 
PAC News brings you updates and breaking news in English across all of our platforms and channels. The EAC News app, YouTube, Facebook, Telegram, Twitter, and our website www.eacnews.asia. Join me and the rest of the EAC News team every day on your favorite channels. EAC News, Cambodia made clear. Formula One will light at Las Vegas on a Saturday night in November 2023 as the streets of Sin City are taken over by the fastest cars and most famous drivers in the world, officials said on Wednesday 30th of March. The Las Vegas Grand Prix 6.12 kilometer track will see drivers roar past landmarks such as the Bellagio Fountains and Caesars Palace. This is an incredible moment for Formula One that demonstrates the huge appeal and growth of our sport with a third race in the United States, said Stefano Dominicali, president and CEO of Formula One. Las Vegas is a destination known around the world for its excitement, hospitality, thrills, and of course, the famous strip. There is no better place for the Formula One to race than in the global entertainment capital of the world, and we cannot wait to be here next year. The sport previously struggled to make inroads in the country, particularly after an infamous six-car race at Indianapolis in 2005 left huge reputational damage. But its popularity has been surging in the United States, which this year will host the Miami Grand Prix in May and the United States. States Grand Prix in Austin in October. The popular Netflix doc series Drive to Survive has also turbocharged interest. Next year's race marks the return of Formula One to Las Vegas, which was the site of the Caesars Palace Grand Prix in the early 1980s. Uh, look at this iconic backdrop. Uh, there is uh, nowhere better for Formula One to be here. It's impressive. And uh, in November 2023, the best racing on the planet will be on the street of Las Vegas under these lights. It'll be amazing. For us, this is a perfect partnership, I have to say. The excitement uh, and the intensity of Formula One in this entertainment capital of the world. Well, we can expect a, a great moment for the sport, for Formula One, a great excitement, uh, incredible place to be. If you look behind, you see all the F1 uh, Las Vegas 2023 logo on the strip is something unique. We are very proud of it. We will really we want to thank the community uh, because, uh, you know, when we are coming in such a place, you know, with so many things happening, you know, you never know. But we do believe that uh, we're going to be here doing something spectacular where the fans will love to come. And we are waiting for looking forward to see that in uh, very soon, because, you know, we're talking about November 2023. It seems uh, very far, but it's not. Well, the perfect match is because we are in an iconic city. You see the layout, the contest here is amazing. Uh, we're going to have the right atmosphere, the right intensity, the right passion. And that's the reason why we feel really at home already here today. Uh, in life, never say never. Uh, because if you think where we were in the U.S. Uh, just a couple of years ago, it was difficult to have, uh, you know, one race full of people. Now we are having already two fully booked. Uh, actually, we could do uh, the double and it will be full. So I think that for sure for the... For the short term, that will be definitely the best solution. I am laser focused, that's my job on our economy as governor. And we know the economic impact that Formula One is going to have on this community is enormous. We are anticipating 170,000 visitors to town to watch this race. They will accommodate 400,000 room nights, which is absolutely amazing. And the economic impact is, the direct economic impact is approaching a half of a billion dollars, and the indirect impact will be over a billion dollars by the time we're done. We could not be more proud. The opportunity to host the Formula One race is something, and I predict that this will be the iconic race, the flagship race of F1 
within a couple of years. That's how well this is going to be received. I mean, the excitement is building up, so it's difficult to say that today. We will discuss in the next couple of months. But for sure, you know, with this level of, uh, of, of competition, with the levels of attention, the problem is not the number of races. It's to make sure that the, each of them represent really a unique events where people can have really fun and enjoy. Russian soccer authorities are serious about a bid to host a European Championship in 2028 or 2032, while its national and club teams are being unfairly punished because they have done nothing wrong, a senior official said on Thursday, 31st March. Alexei Sokin was the CEO of 2018 World Cup in Russia and former member of FIFA's ruling council said that his country has everything in place to host the tournament. Russian clubs and national teams have been suspended from FIFA and UEFA competition due to the war in Ukraine, which denied Russia the chance to qualify for this year's World Cup finals through the European playoffs. The Russian Football Union has appealed the suspension to the Court of Arbitration for Sports in Lazwane. But Sokin said that the state of affairs does not mean Russia cannot bid for hold future tournaments. European soccer governing body UEFA have opened the bidding process for both Euro 2028 and 2032 and Russia has yet state which addition it will focus its bid upon. The United Kingdom nations and Ireland have made a declaration of interest to host the 2028 competition along with Turkey and Russia. Italy along with Turkey and Russia has said it was intended to bid for 2032. Sorkin told reporters that it was a long time until 2032, indicating a bid was more likely to be for that tournament, but said that there was still time to select which year to focus on. What, what does Russian football have to do with, with all this? Or what, what has Russian football done wrong? Uh, I don't find any, any clause in uh, FIFA statutes that were broken by the Russian football. What's happening is uh, is received with disappointment by Russian fans that the uh, European event has been taken away, that the team is not playing. That's that's very disappointing for Russian fans. Of course, we're very emotional about this. Uh, it's uh, it's very sad for us to see refusals of uh, other players of other teams to play with our with our team. We, we could understand, I think, again, as a, my own personal opinion, we, we could understand the, the removal to another neutral territory, which is done, but to simply take away a team. But again, that's my personal opinion. Well, the right but again, again we, we're talking to the wrong person. We are football organizers. We do not engage in, uh, in political debates or the reasons uh, why certain things are happening. The world is not perfect. All we're saying is that football teams and football lovers should not be punished for that, no matter what country they represent. We've known him for a very long time. We regret that he has these emotions, but uh, it is difficult for them. I understand that. But don't it you must be difficult for them. But uh, again, I'm here not to discuss politics and not to discuss military activities or anything. We're here at the FIFA Congress. Well, if we, if we remember uh, the bid for the World Cup, initially it started as a uh, as dual bid for almost every country. And then the countries kind of naturally focused on the year that uh, that is more preferable to them. But initially everybody bid for everything. And uh, I think that's, we could suspect that this is the process that, uh, that we're looking at, where the countries have submitted and then be more clarity on uh, who is focusing more on which year. Uh, the process will, uh, uh, will bring more clarity on the way, that's what I believe. We were preparing for the Champions League final and it was uh, taken away. Again, we deeply regret that there is a whole team of my colleagues who have been who spent uh, three years of their time preparing the best Champions League final. And they can do that no more. Uh, we have emotions also, just like any other people have their emotions. Sorokin told reporters that it was a long time until 2032, indicating a bid was more likely for the tournament 
but said there was still time to select which year to focus on. The countries have submitted the bids and then we will have more clarity on who will be focusing more on which year. The process will be more clarity on the way, that's what I believe he said. Ukraine football officials were not able to attend the FIFA Congress, but delegates were shown an emotional video message from Ukraine FA President Alderit Pavlako, who was filmed wearing a bulletproof jacket. I have known him for a very long time. We regret that he has these emotions, said Sokrin. But it's difficult, I understand that. It must be difficult for them, but again, I'm here not to discuss politics or military activities or anything. I'm here for FIFA Congress, he added. Ukraine was represented by the ambassador of Qatar, Andriy Kazameko, who repeated a call from Russia's soccer authorities to be removed from FIFA. But Sokrin said that football bodies should not be held responsible for expressing the disappointment that the host of this year's Champions League final had been taken away from St. Petersburg. What does Russia football have to do with all this? What has Russia done wrong? I don't find any clause in the FIFA status that we were broken by the Russian football. What's happening is received with disappointment by Russian fans and the Europeans event has been taken away, he said. On a tree-lined unpaved road in Somalia's capital, people duck out of their homes to stare in awe at an unusual sight. Two young men atop white horses, racing neck and neck in training for what would be the city's first horse races in decades. Slowly improving security has fueled demand for sports and leisure activity, and horse riding has proved a hit. Watching the training murder of five, Abshira Mohammed said she was happy to see an activity that inspired young people and entertained parents like her. This is very interesting. I am very happy to watch this. I encourage them to keep up the horse racing, and I thank him for training the yours and entertaining the parents, said Abshira. Yayi is 29, established his stable to offer riding lessons to the public and to eventually host competitions in Mukadishu between riders from the city and from the country's semi-autonomous regions. The capital is still frequently hit by deadly suicide bombings by the Al-Qaeda-linked Al-Shabaab, which aims to topple the central government. The stable is a bet that instability will not worsen, said is. In the past, Somalia was famous for horses. Traditionally, Somalis love horses. We are not training yours so that in the near future we can get Somali teenagers who can participate in horse racing competitions, he said. During the era of military dictator Siedbar, who was toppled in 1991, only police were tossed horseback riding. But the new stable, which operates out of the Mogadishu Stadium and is home to 14 horses, has attracted those of young Somalis who have signed up for lessons and dream of racing in international competition one day. More than 30 students have completed a six-month riding courses at his stable and less has a full-time student currently enrolled, each paying $100 per month. His and his three fellow trainers do not earn a salary, he said, and he fund his school through his car hiring and land leasing business. I want to develop the Somali horse to the international standard. In the world, horse races are funded by big companies and since our country is reviving from numerous setbacks, I am determined to develop horse racing, he said. He said he hoped the government would provide support to grow the stable and develop the sport further in the country. Now let's have a look at the weather and what you can expect tomorrow. And finally, a great hornbill has beaten cancer with the help of 3D technology and a medical team from Florida.
When veterinarians at Zoo Tampa first noticed a lesion suspected to be squamous cell carcinoma, a type of skin cancer, on the cask of a great hornbill known as crescent, they knew they had to think creatively in order to save her. Frequently when this is diagnosed in hornbills, uh, it is unfortunately a death sentence. Dr. Baker found out that a great hornbill in Singapore had its beak replaced using 3D printed technology and immediately got to work looking for experts in the U.S. who could help her to do the same thing, including physicians who typically work on humans. Most of the time when we approach human physicians, they get very excited and they're like, oh, it's an animal. <laughs> and, you know, they really do want to help us, um, which is really exciting for us, too, that they kind of, you know, share our passion and and really want to kind of participate in the care of these animals. A private biomedical 3D laboratory designed a new custom 3D cast as well as a 3D printed surgical guide for surgeons on where they needed to remove the tumor. The surgeons used dental acrylic to seal the 3D printed cask to the hornbill's beak before using titanium screws to permanently attach it. Crescent, the 25-year-old hornbill who is three feet long, recovered almost immediately from the medical procedure and is now thriving with her new beak. She is the first great hornbill to get a 3D printed prosthetic beak in the U.S. and only the second in the whole world, according to Zoo Tampa. Oh, baby. Oh, oh. Thank you for watching the Daily Roundup here on ESC News Channel. For more breaking news and updates, check our website ESCnews.asia or search ESC News on Telegram, Smart TV or at your favorite app store. More from ESC News team tomorrow night at 8 p.m. See you then.